organization that works to develop and support and promote uh, th the commercial art industry in this province. And I would just like to give a special acknowledgement to the staff and the board and the Art Now Planning Committee because they've been working for many months to realize this event and it's just one of many projects that they have throughout the year to support visual art in Saskatchewan. Um, I would also like to take a moment to uh, note that we are here on Treaty 6 territory and this is the traditional territory of the Cree, Dene, Soto, Dakota, Lakota and Nakota peoples as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. As I make this statement, I am a settler here and I would like to acknowledge um, that ancestry of mine that has um, afforded me many privileges living on this land. Uh, there are privileges that I've uh, really come to realize in recent years. Um, and I would also like to state that I'm really grateful for all of the work that is done by visual artists and curators, writers, educators, cultural workers uh, who have shared their experiences through their art as Indigenous peoples on this land. Experiences that I know can be um, very difficult, not only in a historical sense, but also because of systems that we have today. And finally, with that land acknowledgement, I would like to state that I realize it's, it's fairly empty and meaningless if it's not accompanied by attitudes and actions that work towards the rights and freedoms of everyone on this treaty land. Um, I would just like to give you a little bit of a roadmap for how our panel will go. So in just a minute, I will provide a bit of a biography and introduction to Sandra. And we're going to spend about one hour talking about the artworks that will project up here behind us. And there will be time afterwards for questions. So if you do have something that comes up, just hold on to that thought and we'll open up the floor for questions after our discussion. Uh, this panel is also being live streamed. So uh, a special hello to anyone who is tuning in online. Uh, happy to be able to connect this way. And finally, this panel will be recorded and available on the Sask Gallery's YouTube page after Art Now this weekend. Okay, without further ado, um, I would like to introduce Sandra Fraser. Sandra has worked as a curator and an art historian for 25 years. Much of her work involves grappling with the many and at times problematic ways that art museums and their collections create meaning. Her exhibition projects often address broader issues of cultural production and thinking through place. Sandra has a master's in art history from York University and a certificate of museum management and curatorship from Sir Sanford Fleming College. Sandra loves talking about art almost as much as she likes talking about cats and learning the wisdom of their ways. Thanks, Sandra, for being here. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me. This is a really lovely opportunity to talk about art in a very different context than I typically do. Um, I met Jessie when uh, she was uh, director curator at the Mann Art Gallery. And I always love meeting fellow art historians because we are a rare, a specialized breed of art nerds. Um, and Jesse, as I'm sure you know, is a curator and arts administrator living on Treaty 6 in Prince Albert. Um, in her, uh, her real interest within art history is interiority and domestic spaces. And Jesse's got a BA from the University of Saskatchewan and an MA from Utrecht University, which I think is very exotic and fantastic. Um, and so in addition to her position at the Mann Art Gallery, she's also been at the Barber Institute of Fine Arts. And currently she's uh, working independently on a various 
uh, various creative projects with artists, organizations such as Art Now, and municipalities in Saskatchewan. And Jesse believes in, in a life guided by art and that art creates meaningful communities and spaces. And I couldn't agree more. Well, that's great. <laughs> and we're going to see how perhaps living with original works of art um, can add meaning to our lives in our discussion. So as we go through these 10 pieces, we're going to look at them formally. So looking at their visual elements like color, line, form, texture, et cetera. And we'll also bring some personal interpretations to the work, uh, place some of them in a historical context. And throughout this discussion, we'll bring up some ideas and thoughts and questions about um, collecting art and thinking of purchasing original art and who knows what else might come up. <laughs> so cats, cats. Oh, there might be cats. I have to say though, I am not a cat lover and it's risky putting that statement out there. <laughs> I know. However, <laughs> let's begin with a painting that I think is very much a celebration of the medium, encaustic, of color, of light. It's really this, this burst of a landscape that we're beginning with. Uh, this is a piece titled Lake Reflections 2 by Kathy Bradshaw. And this artwork is actually just across the wall from us here on display at Black Spruce Gallery. Uh, Black Spruce is a, is a beautiful uh, space located in Waska Sioux and they have various pop-ups throughout the province when you can't access Waska Sioux in the colder months. So I think looking at this piece for me, even though I know it fits within this landscape genre, if it wasn't for that defining line that suggests horizon and, and perhaps some trees to the edges, like this could be an abstracted piece because there's so much focus on the shapes of the clouds um, how they interact with the sky and then that reflection in the water. I think that Kathy maybe has taken a lake as a jumping off point, but she's using color and the encaustic medium to, to really celebrate a place that perhaps is special to her. Um, I think it's interesting to maybe talk about encaustic a little bit too. Uh, it's, a, it's an ancient medium that involves essentially painting with wax and how that's done is uh, beeswax is, is usually mixed with a type of resin and it's melted down so it has to be heated on, on kind of a hot plate and then the artist will mix in uh, maybe oil paint or, or a dry pigment. They'll mix that into the melted wax and then that becomes their paint and then they apply it to their surface. Um, and as they get their different colors of that wax medium on there, um, they'll then take a source of heat, like a heat gun, and kind of meld them together. So in a way, these encaustic paintings um, work with many of our senses, because sometimes they have a really nice beeswax <laughs> smell, which is actually a really pleasant, uh, pleasant thing, so, yeah. yeah. Um, and this is where the digital media really fails artists and us as viewers. Because when you see this work in person, you see this incredible texture. And I don't know all the artists, so if you're one of the artists I'm talking about, please just like give me a wink or something so I can smile back at you. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I really uh, uh, admire about this work and the other work that I saw here is the sense of texture. And I'm not an artist myself, but I understand um, from burning candles that once the heat goes away, the wax solidifies. So that's one of the challenges of working in, a, in caustic that is different from working in paint, which remains um, liquid and um, kind of lively, right? With wax, it, once it hits a cooler surface, 
it becomes more solid. So it is a real skill, I think, to work in encaustic, and it's very easy to fail. Um, but I just, I, I think Kathy's doing such a lovely job in how she's touching down that, that pigment, that wax pigment on the surface. Um, because I, it is challenging and it gives you such a more luscious uh, surface. Um, and it's a, mo it's a more sensual surface too, like you were talking about the scent. But the, that the texture of the wax and the pigment holding that wax, um, I think makes this work really special. I agree. Um, I totally agree that, well, with, with every piece that you might see here or online, you then have to go and see it in person. It's a much more rich experience, and that is true 10 times over with the encaustic pieces. And adding to that point, um, I think with encaustic, because of the way that the wax melds and, and fuses together once you get the heat on it, there's an element that's, that's less in your control than if you were using a paintbrush to apply it and, and finish with the paintbrush. Like if she has a heat gun and there's heat coming out, <laughs> it, the, the wax tends to move around a little bit and that's probably how we get some of the shapes and the sense of movement here that I think is a big part of the feeling of, of this piece. Um, Sometimes I think there's a temptation for artists to, to really be meticulous in their depictions of their subject and to get like the shape of the cloud just right and every single tree just right. But with encaustic, that's, that's too far. <laughs> you know, it's, I don't wanna say it's impossible, but that I think that the medium really affects um, the outcome of the piece. And, and I've seen some other work of Kathy's that know that she, she has such a variety of, of subjects um, in her work. There's a lot of animals that she does. Um, and she, she has this wonderful collection of bees, which is appropriate for encaustic and using beeswax. <laughs> Don't know if that was intentional or not. But there's this sense of freedom when you're not bound to one, being known for one type of subject. And I think we get that coming through here. And one thing that I noticed when I was looking at this particular work and the other, I would say the landscape works in particular, is the sense of the color m m moving and melting and cooling. You, you, you still get that sense of the, the process in the final work. Um, so that blending together which suggests movement, and I think that works really well with the landscape as a subject. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. All right, let's go on to our second piece, shall we? Okay. Oh, oopsie, I'm sorry. I'm going one too far. All right. I, from the outset, have to state my bias here. Um, <laughs> because I've worked with on the Avenue Gallery in Prince Albert, where I live, um, on a couple of different projects, and, and we have worked together to uh, have a booth here at Art Now. Um, so I've been familiar with this piece for a little while. Uh, I know the owners of <laughs> the gallery, so I just want to put uh, that out there, that I, I maybe come to this with a bit of a different perspective than, than the other works. Um, but I thought this was uh, a lovely and unique piece um, by Buck Nelson. Uh, it's a carving of a moose antler. And to me, this piece has such a strong connection with nature and with the land, uh, not only because of the material, it's, it's an antler from a moose, but because of Buck and, and his life and how he works. Uh, he's a fishing guide in the warm months of the year, and then he works on his carving in the winter. So uh, I think his life is really lived in nature, and, and he has a history of, of living on the land and 
I think, really knowing what he's carving in this piece in particular, <laughs> which, is, uh, which are the beautiful fish that you see. And I think you can get a great sense that he has knowledge, such knowledge of their form and confidence in that knowledge. Um, to me, this, this work is also so physical. It's physical in how we, as the people viewing it, have to engage with it, walking around it, like many sculptural pieces. But I, I can just imagine how it must be for Buck to work with this piece, to, to come across the moose antler, as, as the moose would have shed it in late summer, um, to find it, to look at its form, because of course they're all unique antlers, and, and to envision something in it, and then, then to work with that shape to, to bring that vision to reality. Um, so just, just working around that horn and the sharp points of it in itself is, <laughs> is a very physical way of working with sculpture. One of the things that I found interesting when I was looking at this piece compared to some of the other work that he did where he um, utilized the, the form of the antler to create. So there's one of a loon where it takes advantage of the shape of the antler to articulate the neck and the head and the beak of the loon. Whereas here he's using the broad face to create something um, that is independent of the form of the antler, if you understand what I mean. And uh, it seems to me to be incredibly complex. I can, I mean, when I look at those little touch points and the incredible detail of those fish, just think of all the potential mistakes that an artist could make to to ruin the piece and and because it's so representational there's I don't think you could go back and fix it right like eh, he would have to have such clarity of intention with the image and understand where he wanted to go where those touch points were in terms of the fins right, in order to achieve that composition. I think it's just extraordinary from a technical perspective and as a way of um, articulating his relationship with nature and the land. I think that's a really um, important thing when you're looking at an artist's work, if you're looking to collect work, is that sense that the, the work is really coming from somewhere deep and authentic within the artist. And I really get that from this. I agree. I think um, we can tell when work is being made for a market, <laughs> perhaps, right? Um, sometimes we know, or artists know, what sells and and one can lose a sense of the truth of even of who they are in getting that across. But I agree, this piece, it, it says so much about the artist and, and his life. And, and to build on your point about that confidence that he must have to know what he wants to carve out here. And this is a reductive process, right? Like once he carves something, it, it can't come back. <laughs> So to know the forms of what he's doing, to have in his mind ahead of time that composition and every little detail is really quite, I think, a vision. Um, I know he's been doing this for about two decades, so there's lots of practice, but still with, it's like his canvas is totally different every single time. It's not standard <laughs> at all. And I wonder if as he as he first starts to get to know the antler and just like, just feel it and work with it and examine its shape, I wonder how he decides what he wants to, to depict in there, how that comes out. But I agree, totally, totally personal to him and, and it's beautiful how, how that shows. So, yeah. Lots of times I think like, 
you know, we see maybe antlers and like elements of the the big fauna, you know, like above a fireplace <laughs> in an old cabin or something. But but this is a different way of uh, showing that. So yeah, I thought a really unique and really beautiful piece from Buck. So. I'm biased, but thanks on the avenue for uh, <laughs> for bringing that here to art now. <laughs> and if I could be somewhat provocative, um, talked briefly, I was like, Jesse, is it okay if I talk about appropriation? So, and in this case, if I was looking at this work and I didn't know who the artist was or didn't know their background, I think I would want to know where they're coming from. What is their relationship with the material? What's their relationship with the subject? What's their relationship with the land? Right? Um, because I think that um, it's important. I mean, we can talk, authenticity of expression can be approached in many, many, many different ways. But when you know something is culturally significant, but it, is not something that's culturally significant to you. As an artist, you might want to think about staying in your own lane, right? There are other ways for you to stretch yourself and um, engage without crossing that, that line. Uh, and that's something I would say if you're looking at a work and you have a feeling that this is a work that's created by an indigenous person or a person of color because of the subject matter, then it behooves you to really like look at who who is making this work and do I feel comfortable with um, the approach the artist is taking. Um, and, it, and it's the same with other subject matter. It could be anything at all. Like does this person actually know about their subject in a way that I feel comfortable? with mm -hmm. right yeah and i mean today we're seen in in so many sectors in so many ways misrepresentation right and how that can be linked to abuse of power um, and position in society so i agree i i do think uh if you're looking at art and especially at buying art and and having it in your space um I think there's a, res a responsibility that you have to take to to look into it, and you may not know the artist, but I think it can be examined. So, yeah, that's a great point, Sandra. Yeah. So, our next piece is titled "A Lesson" by David Garneau. <laughs> um, and there could be some ideas that are <laughs> are linked to uh, to what we just talked about with Buck's work, um, but I have to say that when I saw this piece, uh, which is at a Cinnaboya Gallery in Regina, I was immediately struck by even looking at it digitally a sense of beautiful painting, <laughs> and then after seeing some more of David's still life works, which come from a recent um, project that he's worked on, I. I just love love his paint, <laughs> so aesthetically I appreciate it. But um, I was struck by this um, fairly simple representation of of these two objects, a set of rocks and the spine of a book, and and they're shown I think in quite a direct way, and it makes me immediately think of the relationship that they have with one another and how David is making us consider that relationship. Um, there's many differences between these two objects. We have a group of small rocks with a, a very high degree of, of texture, um, beautiful shadows and lines and colors shown in them. And they're together and they are sitting right beside a book which almost feels a little precarious because it doesn't have the solidity <laughs> that, uh, that this group of rocks does. Um, and knowing that uh, David is a, a Métis person and has examined um, where knowledge comes from and knowing that he holds a position at the University of Regina, I automatically read into this that perhaps he is looking at 
different systems of knowledge and different ways that knowledge is shared. And I think he's represented two different ways in a, in a really beautiful piece. Yeah, I think David is a really academic painter in the sense of this high realism and quite a didactive intent. So even if you're not aware of what the intent is, the intent is the most important thing. It's not about his technique. It's not about how he's pushing paint around. The, the most important thing about David's work is the message that he is trying to convey. Um, and yeah, we have a clear juxtaposition between these two ways of knowing. One, this pillar of Western philosophy that's represented by this book. And as Jesse said, rather precarious, like it's maybe not precarious, but it seems to be unsupported, like could f topple. Um, and then the three rocks, which represent indigenous knowledge and indigenous ways of knowing. Um, and this I know because I am familiar with David's practice and I understand um, some of his intention in the work that he creates. I wouldn't know this otherwise. Um, and one of the things I think that David maybe tries to do in his uh, academic work and his artwork is kind of bring the book and the rocks closer together. So that's what I think about when I look at this work. There's this gap, and, it, and it's not that big. It's not a big gap, but it's still a gap. And when I spend a little more time looking at it, I find the shadows very curious. What is creating the shadows in that way. I can't picture what it is that is making the shadows come across the book that way or create that open space at the back. Um, but you know how sun is in shadows? I don't believe that it's impossible or anything, but I, it, it um, piques my curiosity about where the, sh where the shadows are and maybe knowing David's work what intentionality might there be in the way that he is rendering these shadows? Like why these, why this play of light and shadow? Um, but yeah, but it's also in some ways a really lovely, elegant, almost abstract work. It's very quiet, but it's very meaningful. Yeah. I agree. At first it seems like perhaps a straightforward representation of these objects. But the more you spend time with this piece, I think the more questions come up. I was also wondering about the source of light. <laughs> you know, what, what do these lines and the shadows mean? Who is casting them, right? Um, and another thing I noticed, and again, just from looking online uh, at a digital image, is that there is a beautiful range of warm and cool tones in this piece. And it's again, it's quite subtle, but there's these lovely warm tones for the most part in, in the rocks. And then there's this coolness <laughs> in the book. Not, and again, not to say that these have to be two totally separate and distinct entities. I also wonder if he's examining how these systems of knowledge, ways of knowing, can coexist, right? Um, and then I also begin to see more cool and warm, subtle shifts in the background and, and in the surface that the objects are on. And, and that's a bit of a metaphor to me about harmonious living, right? Things from opposite and different ends of a spectrum can be together. So I, I appreciate that. And I think this is a wonderful thing about being able to spend time with an artwork is that you see new things all the time. Or maybe you don't see something new, but you have a, a new thought about it <laughs> or a different thought about it. So yeah, it's, it's one reason why having a piece of original art in your home is, is a really wonderful thing. Um, I also want to bring up the points that um, sometimes we, 
we search so much for meaning <laughs> in an artwork and a specific message and knowing David's background, knowing his place of work, you know, Sandra's worked with David uh, in the past, um, we bring a certain knowledge to it, but I also think that David and, and probably most artists who have work on display here totally understand that every viewer is bringing their own history and background and interpretation to it, and, and they are just as valid <laughs> interpretations as, as his own intentions. Lovely. Um, I should mention that um, this piece is part of an online portion of Art Now. So in addition to seeing the works here in person this weekend, you can go and look at the, a selection of the works online until September 30th. So and the work extent. that's here is really en enigmatic to me. This one, I'm like, OK, I'm familiar enough with your work that I understand. I believe that I understand. The work that's here are um, like maybe four or five slimmer books in a clamp hung on a wall. And I'm like, OK. I want to th think a little bit more about that. That um, isn't as clear to me what the meaning is, although I understand that the book is a representation of Western knowledge. What's the clamp in bringing the books together? Um, and that's, a, uh, that's the other interesting thing. When you get to know artists and you see their work and you see the themes that they're exploring, um, you can sometimes get a deeper understanding of why they're approaching a particular subject, right? It's not necessarily an aesthetic choice, it might be a, a more subject-based matter uh, thing, or it could be an aesthetic thing that, a motif that is repeated through their work. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, looking at a series of pieces it's a fantastic thing. <laughs> and I think as artists, a really nice way of working through a variety of ideas that are related, but that you need multiple pieces uh, to express and shape. Yeah, I agree. Oh, yes. Sorry. A noose. Yeah, he has nooses, yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the noose uh, clearly alludes to the largest, you know, well, the biggest thing in prairie history, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, Oops. yeah, super powerful. And I think the clamp probably y your b relates to that, the pressure constriction, mm -hmm. metaphorically, perhaps. Mm -hmm. See the conversations that art creates. <laughs> okay. Okay. We ready for the next one? We're ready. Okay. <laughs> so from one still life, in a sense of the word, to another, you know, coming from Western art historical training, we really like to classify things into their genres. So <laughs> I see this, and I think still life. <laughs> but you know, it's it's not like really still <laughs> to me. There's there's a lot of lines and shadows, pushing around of oil paint here, and these, these objects are a little bit more active. <laughs> um, the history of still life um, is really associated with um, an idea referred to as memento mori, and that is uh, referring to the fact that our life here as humans on this earth is very temporary. Um, we get a lot of that in Dutch 17th century art, which is what I focused on for a while, so <laughs> I'm a little, again, biased with, with some of that coming in here. Um, but, like, I don't get the sense here that what Bridget Aitken is showing us is this reminder of um, our temporary lives and how fragile that can, they can be. I think she's rendered these objects that we see, some bottles, some pieces of fruit, a little sculpture of a cow, it looks like, with a real sense of 
solidity. <laughs> so she's, she's departing from some of the associations that we have in an art historical context uh, with this piece. Um, one thing I also wanted to say about this is that um, I, I think that she really enjoys this palette and the formal elements here. The color blue, it's a, it's a deep blue, but there's a great sense of brightness to it as well, um, especially in, in the background. And then that really, I think, brings forth what she's got going on in the bottom half or the foreground of the piece here um, with some lighter blues and then having the warm tones uh, creep in. Um, but I don't know what these objects mean um, to Bridget, and I wonder if she's focusing on their decorative nature. And then, s so through this painting, she's she's combining painting and decoration. You know. Yeah, I don't know Bridget either. Are you here? Okay. <laughs> um, but I had the opportunity to look at her work. Um, and this work really struck me actually as rather dark and foreboding. So I don't really, um, like maybe immediately I thought of it as the decorative still life representation of the home life. Um, so maybe a somewhat banal subject matter that's very familiar and comfortable, but then I was looking at this work compared to some of her other work, which seems to be very airy and light and just had so much more breath to it that it made me think that this was actually really dark. And then I'm like becoming the you know, the armchair psychologist, like what was going on when Bridget made this? <laughs> was there something, you know, and I'm totally speculating, I do not know Bridget. Um, like, was there something going on at that moment that was somber, maybe there uh, a bit of grief or something that was particularly challenging because I, when I look at this work compared to her other work, this work seems unresolved. It feels like a struggle to me with it. And it's maybe a little hard to tell, like just in a representation, but when you go look at the work, um, you see the layers of paint. You can tell that Bridget spent time going back into this work, going back in and maybe changing the composition a bit. There's like so many layers of paint that don't seem to me to be necessarily aesthetic, but it's entirely speculation on my part. Um, but yeah, I look at that and I think there's something more happening here that I don't have access to that I, do I want to know? I kind of do. <laughs> I kind of want to know. And that's the great thing about a venue like this where you actually have the opportunity to meet artists or at least talk to the gallerist and say, tell me about this work. Because um, that's something I was thinking, should I ask before this or after, right? Like I, but I think, yeah, there's things going on here that make it more than something decorative. And when you talk about the memento more, memento more, where everything was symbolic, every object was situated because it had some additional meaning. I'm not sure I see that here, but I do feel this other like tension in the work. So maybe there could be ideas related to <laughs> difficult concepts like transience and life. <laughs> Maybe not that far or deep, <laughs> but, uh, but something that comes out in the way that she's worked the paint and the canvas or like these many layers. Yeah, that, but that feeling that emerges is... And maybe it's just my <laughs> state of mind, right? Like, right. isn't it, I mean, uh, there's what the artist gives you and it's what it, where it sits with you.
and why it resonates with you or why it doesn't, right? Sometimes things are a little too close to home. You're like, nah, I don't really want to be reminded of that. <laughs> or other things that you're like, that makes me feel just, I have this, this reminds me of this really wonderful time in my life or this wonderful person. And so the artwork, even though it has nothing to do with you, you bring that to it and you hold on to that and the work becomes a part of you. Yeah, yeah. So that makes me think of a question for you, Sandra. <laughs> Assuming as someone um, who has 25 years of art history <laughs> experience, I'm guessing that you have some pieces of art on your wall at home, some original works of art. And do you know all of the artists whose work you have? Yes, I do, yeah. So for me, my husband's an artist, and so a lot of the work that we have um, are we acquired through him trading his work with other artists or going to art shows and acquiring small things. So yeah, some, some artists I know um, not intimately at all, and others, um, I know uh, much better, yeah. Um, but I don't actually, when I buy art for myself, I don't care what the artist's intent is. <laughs> I really was like, it's all about me. It's my house, it's my wall, it's all about me. Like, do I like it? Do I wanna look at it? Yes. I, it doesn't, it honestly doesn't matter to me in my own home. Like, like I appreciate, I, of course, I, I appreciate the effort and the ideas, but as long as I feel good about it, I, that's enough for me. Well, I find that sometimes um, I'll look at a work of art and I don't know the artist, but the more I spend time with that piece and, and see other pieces that they've done, I feel like I'm getting to know them, right? And it's actually kind of a cool thing to feel as though you know a person through their work and then meet them like a couple years later. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, but I know you, but <laughs> hello. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I was thinking about this question and I think with every piece in, in my house too, I realize that I, I know all of them and do have a, a personal connection and that's certainly um, gives the artwork uh, a specific dimension <laughs> for me, but, but just like you, I can see a piece and not know anything about the artist, but, but be intrigued and, and then it's about me. <laughs> so lots of ways that relationships can <laughs> take place <laughs> through original art in the home. Okay, so we are now looking at Spring Fling Raven Earrings by Melody Armstrong. And these are shown through the Saskatchewan Craft Council. And I, I chose these pieces as part of our 10 because I really wanted to bring up the idea that if you're looking at having original art, it doesn't always have to be like a two-dimensional work on the wall. That might be something that we think of immediately, but jewelry, <laughs> you know, jewelry is a, a beautiful art form. Uh, and, and as I looked into Melody's practice and spent some time with these pieces, I, I came to appreciate more and more both the craftsmanship and the technical skill, the way she works with the material, um, but then also these pieces as works of art in their own right. Um, I, I do have a couple of pieces of um, beaded jewelry at home and I might not wear them every single day but I really value when I do <laughs> wear them um, and I I appreciate them as works of art and actually like I they're not tucked away but I I keep them shown like in a place where I can see them every day so there's many ways that we yeah. can appreciate original works of art yeah so maybe fashion is like a gateway the gateway drug into painting or <laughs> what not. I shouldn't make fun of drugs, but it's, uh, yeah, and it, because it's more affordable, not always though. Like sometimes you could buy a painting for less than a pair of earrings. Um, 
but it is uh, certainly, actually for me, I probably bought um, like artist made jewelry before I ever bought uh, a work of art that goes on the wall. And then you show it off and it's not just jewelry, but clothing and yeah. other accessories. And that's a really nice way actually to support artists, particularly artists like local artists or um, and then people always say, oh, I love your earrings. Or, and then you can tell them about this great artist. And um, so it's like mobile art. So yeah, I think uh, jewelry and other kinds of accessories, fashion is a really, uh, maybe even underutilized form, like particularly fashion, maybe not jewelry, like in Saskatchewan, like how many fashion designers are there in Saskatchewan? Lots? Okay. Good to know. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you later. <laughs> um, but the fact that I don't know, that's something. Anyhow, uh, yeah, and or even like things that aren't, uh, isn't a painting on a wall, isn't uh, fashion, but is a, something, an accessory for your home, right? There's beautiful clay and wood things that I think maybe uh, sometimes are more accessible is either they have a function or they allude to a function even if you would never use them they look like you could use them and that can be something like a also an introduction to acquiring something that's made by a, a living person in your community um, because sometimes we can be intimidated by a work of art and like, do I have enough expertise? Is this good enough? I don't know anything. It's like, well, whereas other kinds of objects you look and you can appreciate the technical skills that went into it or you appreciate the color and the form and you feel a little more like comfortable saying, I think this is good and I want to show it in my space. One thing that amazes me about um, pieces like this and in other media like clay, for example, is the fact that artists begin with just that material, maybe like a slab of clay or like a piece of metal. <laughs> and then they, they work it and they have this vision to bring out what we see here. And again, to have that, that confidence in the form that they want to create and then they spend the time doing it. Because I know it doesn't happen quick and there's a lot of things that can go wrong <laughs> in these processes. So I really, I really admire that um, in the work of a lot of people who we, we classify maybe as, as craftspeople. And I don't know that there has to be such a, a distinction between craft and, and fine art. That might be something that we <laughs> address in a little bit here. Um, but I, I love how Melody is playing with um, some different positive and negative spaces. First in the shape, this kind of, um, like it almost looks a little bit like seaweed actually, which might be appropriate considering that there are <laughs> pearls here, but, but also a, a bit of a floral shape or half floral shape. Um, that we get as, as the main part of, of working with that metal. Um, lovely negative space coming in there, but then also this play between positive and negative with these lines that, that crisscross and that, that are these organic forms within um, the pieces of metal. And I also love, again, the play between warm and cool tones here and the difference in textures and again it's kind of subtle but the the reflections of that kind of peachy color of of the pearl in the metal i think is is really beautiful and i'm sure she knew that when she set those pearls in there how these reflections of light would play out so i, I get the sense i mean i know that she's worked for a couple decades as a jeweler and, and she teaches jewelry in regina um, but uh, really strong knowledge of her forms and her materials and how they work in a really beautiful way together. Yeah. So great pieces. You can go check them out at the Craft Council booth <laughs> at the opposite end uh, of this big room. 
Okay, let's talk about Working on the Railroad by Les Sneesby. <laughs> um, a piece that shows us a huge variety, I think, of a uh, range of tones and textures and to me is both a, a portrait of the people that we see depicted here but, but also of, of the train, of course, which is maybe even more prominent than, than the figures in this image. Um, as we get the more detailed and, and kind of sharp parts in the foreground of this piece compared with the kind of the, the more blurred, non-detailed um, areas that are in the background, um, I actually start to feel a little bit nervous. <laughs> I'm nervous about um, <laughs> this big piece of machinery uh, being behind <laughs> the figures <laughs> and how close they are to this, to this drop-off. Um, but I, I also see this as um, a little bit of a commentary on um, the place of Canadian Pacific Rail in Canada. Um, I, I don't know um, the history that Les has with trains or maybe with where this image came from. Um, but there's quite a contentious history with trains and with the railway in this country. It was, it was promoted as something really positive to unite the place by settlers. <laughs> and also a lot of um, Chinese immigrants were brought over. I read actually 17,000 Chinese people um, who worked on, on constructing the railway um, in the late 1800s in Western Canada, and they were absolutely brutal working conditions, like like super long hours, and it was the Chinese laborers who worked on the most dangerous parts, like like having to detonate explosives to make way for the rails, um, like no nutrition, no sleep, you know, nothing, and so many lives were lost um, of immigrants in something that we really celebrate <laughs> today. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering if there's some of that history that the artist either has a personal connection with or, or maybe wants to draw our attention to. And I could see that that history would be something that might resonate with um, a viewer. I think this is the kind of work where the subject matter of the train and the history of Canada would be of interest, um, might be compelling, uh, or even that sense of nostalgia that, sh that you get. It seems very clear, um, and again, I don't know this particular artist, that it is uh, from a photograph. So it's got that black and white quality, which gives it uh, historical tone and one thing when I um, so Jesse sh uh, showed me some of the images that she wanted to talk about and then I came in to look at the actual work and I knew it wasn't a photo I could tell it wasn't a photograph but when you first look at it you kind of read it as a photograph and then you realize that it's a watercolor so I was thinking about um, when you look at something, you might have an impression about how it's made, um, whether it's a photograph or a painting or textile work or clay. Um, and the sense of surprise when you realize that it's actually made from another material. Um, and sometimes it's a good surprise, and sometimes it's not a good surprise. You're like, oh. It would have been better if it was what I thought it was. And this is something that I think about when I was looking at this work. Like, what's the difference between a photograph, or how we value a photograph, and a watercolor based on a photograph that I'm assuming the artist didn't take the photograph, right? It's an existing photograph. Um, certainly, technically, it's a very different uh, way of working. Um, and more complex. But then I ask myself too, like, why would someone d 
decide to do this? Why would you make a watercolor based on a photograph? So those are things that I think about when I look at an artist's work. Um, like this particular one, it's like, I, and I would ask him, and like I'm curious about like why did you choose this work? Um, like what kind of meaning does it have for you? Because he, it clearly, when you look at the actual work, it, to me, it looks like it took a long time to do it. Very meticulous, small brushwork. And watercolor is actually this beautiful, like for, I love watercolor that really exploits the water part of a watercolor. Whereas um, this is very tight, right? And there are lots of watercolors that are also tight, but just like, okay, why did you choose this particular medium to execute this? Like, what is the medium, what's your relationship? So this work pr provokes so many questions about um, what its relationship is with the media and with the subject matter. Because you wouldn't just casually choose something that you are gonna put so much of your own labor into, like, so there has to be some kind of sensitivity and um, passion maybe for, for the subject. And to present it in a specific context, right? Like it's presented, sometimes I think photography, uh, we maybe don't put in the fine art <laughs> uh, category. It's, I think there's, there's a range, but working from a photograph, presenting it maybe more as fine art and then in the commercial gallery context. Again, the, the place of display, the way it's displayed, the big kind of mat and frame that it's around, how does that define what this piece is and how that artist is manipulating this image and the history of the image to, to perhaps try and convey a, a certain message. I agree, it brings up a lot of questions, like beyond the, the contents <laughs> of the piece here, right? So, so speaking of photography, next up <laughs> we have a photograph. <laughs> um, this is titled Prairie Blizzard One by John Penner, and it's part of Grasslands Gallery, and the, their booth is also just on the other side of this wall here. I thought this was a really beautiful and subtle and sensitive photograph. Um, it's another one, the more I spend time with it, the more I appreciate different formal elements of it. And maybe we could begin just by talking about um, the specific photography process that he's done here. Um, it's a salt printed photograph. And this is a process in photography that goes back to the very beginnings <laughs> of photography in the 1830s uh, in England with uh, Henry Fox Talbot and he, um, he is considered one of the people who, who did a lot to, um, I think, share knowledge of how to create photographs, a new medium at the time and a new way of looking at the world around you. Um, I'm going to simplify this a lot, but essentially the process is using a really heavy uh, piece of paper, um, coating it with a, a saline solution and then also with a silver solution. So there's, there's two coats and then exposing the negative of the image uh, onto that piece of paper with the coatings on it. Um, so this was a really common way of um, making photographs for a couple of decades from the 1830s to about 1860s-ish, um, you could expose a negative using bright sunlight. <laughs> it's going to give you maybe a bit of an unpredictable result, but, um, but uh, I think it's a way that many artists, well, including John, are actually working today too. And it, it gives a really distinct feel and mood and, and color to the pieces. Like, there's a couple of John's photographs at the ga Grasslands Gallery booth, and they're all in this range of tones, and that comes from the salt printed process. Yeah, as a technique, 
Um, one of the things when you look at the work, normally good black and white photography is judged by how black the blacks are, right? And how clear the whites are and um, that's not uh, a, a, a way of looking at this particular process. So it's really nice to, when you're used to that, that heavy contrast of black and white, to see the warmth that is conveyed through this process. So if you like photography, you'll see this wonderful uh, warmth. And it's, um, I don't know, maybe it's not romantic, but it's quite evocative and mysterious. Um, and it's, it's super simple in terms of the imagery, um, but it's, it's also quite seductive, the, the tones of it. And you, yeah, there's a certain pleasure in, in that sort of mysterious tone and trying to read the image because at first it's really quite, um, it's not blurry per se, it's a blizzard. But when you look at, then you start to see a little more uh, definition, right? In the tree trunks and the branches, the more you look at it. So there's something quite lovely and contemplative about it. So it's an invitation kind of for a contemplative uh, state of mind which, you know, I, I like that. <laughs> I really like how you put that, absolutely. And I think this process is suited in a really nice way to the sky and the different conditions of lighting that are shown here. Again, they're kind of subtle, but it's like they're exposed in just the right way and you let your eye go through the piece and my eye is kind of guided by these different lines. They, they come up from that, that set of trees and the upper lines of the tree trunks and they kind of drift across horizontally throughout the sky. And it, it does feel very meditative in that way. But you know, if this title, Prairie Blizzard, wasn't on this piece, like I, I don't know that I would identify this as a blizzard or really even that it's here on the prairies yeah. it's actually quite unique that this is a landscape piece and it could be just like anywhere any season <laughs> where's the horizon line <laughs> exactly. we need the horizon line. <laughs> but actually what a thing to to have come across in a piece or not come across <laughs> right it's like whatever season you want to read into this <laughs> go for it so yeah um Really lovely work from John Penner, so I encourage you to check it out again in person because it's, it's just fantastic stuff to, to spend time with, even if it's like 30 seconds here. <laughs> it's a really nice resting place for your eyes. So, okay. Let's talk about this piece by Maya Stark. It is called Sleepwalking. I think there's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> um, I'm totally intrigued by this maybe portrait of a person. I, I'm not sure if it's a self-portrait, but uh, this is a case where I'm familiar with Maya's work. I don't know her, but like I feel like I kind of know her by looking at <laughs> her artwork. Um, I do know that Maya is a twin and she's examined that um, identity of being a twin in her work and also um, looking at doppelganger imagery related to twinness <laughs> in her past work. And so while this certainly could relate to that, um, I, I also just read it as a portrait of a single person who has many feelings, <laughs> which may be symbolized by multiple limbs in this piece. Yeah, so this is a, the kind of work where um, it's highly narrative. And I think with this work, I'm somewhat familiar with Maya's work uh, as well. And I think it's the kind of work that um, it might, it might be uh, a richer experience if you understand 
precisely what Maya is thinking or and representing, but I also think her work falls within this narrative tradition of fables and fairy tales. So we have our own, um, maybe we have our own um, data bank of fairy tales and fantasy kind of images that this work draws on that makes it uh, accessible without knowing the artist's actual intent and the specific narrative behind it. Um, but yeah, I'm totally uh, captivated by the arms, the sleepwalking arms and then the hugging arms. And where's the person that she's hugging, right? She's not hugging herself because if she was hugging herself, grabbing her shoulders, but she's not. She's making space for someone else, and that someone is absent. So I feel this sense of uh, grief or longing, even. Um, and then, so I know the twin thing, so I see these two creatures, dog-like creatures, so I think that probably relates to that. Maybe the two sets of arms does too, but we all also have multiple senses of our own self, whether we're twins or not. We have um, different, his we have different uh, phases and qualities. And then when you look at her dress, like the first thing I noticed was one of the lower bands where you see a house that is on fire, right? And that's a horrible, I used to have nightmares about my house burning. So that, to me, when I look at that, I think that's trauma. Like that is a horrible thing to happen. Um, and then I notice the snakes on the bodice of her dress. And I like snakes, but some people don't like snakes. But it's a loaded image, right? The snake is not a neutral kind of image. So that is uh, uh, important. And then I noticed, like kind of in the middle, there's the, this long green grass and then these red hands coming through, right? So there's all these layers of narrative that are very suggestive. And part of it, like, I like not knowing exactly what it is. I like the mystery of it. There's something really tantalizing about not knowing the full meaning behind it, but getting a sense that something is going on, something really intriguing. I'm, I'm intrigued, I'm really curious, but I'm not satiated, I'm not satisfied because I don't know what it is. And in the history of portraiture, if you look at like Renaissance portraits, lots of times the setting, um, the objects that might be surrounding the portrait of a person, their dress, they have very specific and definite meanings. So those attributes tell really defined things about that sitter. And while here we can certainly identify a lot of um, the imagery that is in here, again, we, we don't totally know what's going on and we really read <laughs> a lot into it and there's so many possibilities for that meaning. I actually read this as um, grappling with uh, female identity and expectations of perhaps being very domestic which may be represented by the house that then burns um, of hands like and of the womb, and it's in this big dress, and it's kind of like in that area. And, and the snake, which uh, I think can symbolize many things, like fear, right, kind of creepiness, but also snakes, they shed their skin, and the, it's a symbol of, of rebirth. So I kind of wonder if there's um, a comment on expectations of females and like, and having families and, <laughs> and giving birth and that sort of thing. But this is a very surreal piece, right? We have lots of things that are identifiable in the imagery, and then it's presented in a way that makes us do like a quadruple take <laughs> on, on this. Um, there's lots of unexpected 
things and in in a sense that there's a dreamlike quality there you know even even the background with all of the colors in the sky and in the grass, again, it's like, okay, here's this, this setting, this natural setting. And then the color palette that she's using there, it's, it's totally unexpected and, and not totally natural either. One of Jesse uh, shared with me some potential points of conversation for us. And one was, um, which we haven't touched on at all, was like, should you buy art to match your couch or to go with your couch? And I say, if you like your couch, why not? Anyhow, the reason I bring this up at this particular moment as I was thinking about, uh, I was sitting in my home and looking at the work that I'm surrounded by and certain things that, like in your hallway, um, you just walk by them, right? Or even like above my bed, with the, the headboard, I don't really spend a lot of time looking at that. In the living room, dining room, spend a little more time and so I, look at things for longer periods of time. So I was thinking about um, how, yeah, where art is in your home kind of also matters a bit. Like, how, like this one, I probably, I don't know if I would want it in my dining room, right? Like I love it and I, I would want to spend time looking at it, but do it's a little intense. So would I, want that degree of intensity or would I want it somewhere where I would come upon it and be invited to contemplate it? That's something thinking about, um, yeah, where things are in your home. Um, sometimes you don't like something in a particular place just because of how you're using that space and uh, what takes place. But if you shift it into another space, um, it, it looks great and it feels great. Yeah, it's amazing how after you spend some time living with a piece, like just how much you want to change <laughs> things. But it's also kind of fun to change pieces around, like say every yeah. two years or or whatever. But yeah, I agree. I was kind of thinking of some of the artwork and some I know I might want to have in an area where I'm like doing work and and thinking or or maybe I'm making some of my own art and that's giving me certain pieces of information that like I want to emphasize versus what am I looking at as I'm eating breakfast in the morning. Not to say that I have to look at like pretty things when I <laughs> eat breakfast. <laughs> but yeah, there's, there's lots of possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. Curating your house. Have you ever had anyone ask you, Sandra, can you curate my house for me? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've had that question and I said no. <laughs> it's very yeah. personal. It's I very think. personal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. So on the topic of portraits, <laughs> we have a portrait here of Hildegard of Bingen, and this piece is titled Hildegard's Muse by Marjorie Verloon, and this is shown at Dandelion Framing and Gallery, and Dandelion's a fairly new uh, commercial gallery space with actually a, a wide range of artists on their roster, so a space to check out uh, in Saskatoon here. Um, so here's... Uh, what I was alluding to earlier in talking about Maya's work with how um, in, in Renaissance um, times, in earlier times, um, portraiture was really not only about seeing the face of the sitter, but everything else <laughs> in the piece as well. And I think this is what we've got going on here. There is so much information in this piece that actually does tell us quite a bit about who Hildegard was and I know when I introduced this piece I just said her full name rather than the title and that's because I, I learned about this person Hildegard of Bingen uh, when I was a first year university student and studying music history so um, 
that's one reason I had this personal association why I <laughs> chose this piece. Um, so I'll just tell you, uh, Hildegard was um, a medieval um, nun. She was a philosopher. She was a poet. She was a naturalist and she was a composer. She was many, many things. And it's actually quite remarkable to be all of those things, I think, in any lifetime, but especially in the 12th century and especially as a female. Um, she was really well regarded in all of those fields in which she lived and which she produced work. So when I was studying music history, I, I came to know her first as a composer. And I just have to say that her compositions are still performed today. It's amazing that the manuscript exists and they are stunningly beautiful. <laughs> I know it's totally subjective, but you gotta give them a listen. <laughs> You can find them on YouTube. Anyways, though, so we have um, an allusion to that part of her life in the lower right-hand corner where you can see that manuscript. It doesn't totally look like uh, musical notes that we could read with clarity today. That's because when she was working, uh, music was uh, shown differently. It was shown uh, with little dots that were called neumes, but it's amazing that these manuscripts exist from the 1100s and and they can still be interpreted today. Um, she is holding a book, and you can't totally see the title of the book, but it is called Scivias, um, and that does translate, I have the direct translation here, to Know the Ways of the Lord. And this was a major publication at the time that she worked on for 10 years that shares her views on uh, Catholic life and um, and it was published and well regarded at that time and that manuscript was filled with illustrations that um, are referenced throughout this piece so they're referenced um, in this circular uh, image behind her uh, which shows I think the interconnectedness of life um, and then also um, the imagery is shown in the, that little egg that she is holding there. Um, so making a long story short, I think this is a portrait of an amazing person in history. And I think it's someone clearly that the artist Marjorie has great regard for and I'm amazed that, um, like some other pieces on display at this art fair, that she has done this huge piece, which, by the way, is just right over there. Uh, <laughs> I should have pointed it out. Um, look at that richness uh, of the color in person compared to here on the screen. Um, but to show that in a commercial setting is a big thing. I think this is maybe something that is so personal and can be so vulnerable to the artist, and then to bring it out in any setting, but especially here is actually quite remarkable. Well, like what could I add to that, <laughs> right? That was incredible. And I'm aware of the time and I'm excited to talk about the next work. So I'm gonna just uh, leave that beautiful and intense description Thank you. In, in your words. See, Hildegard is personal to me too and I'm glad Marjorie reminded me of that. <laughs> so let's go to our final piece of the evening. This is Geoform number one by Sandra Lettingham. And this is shown at uh, the gallery art placement. Um, beautiful selection of works in that booth today. So I think this piece is quite a bit different from what we've been looking at this evening. And I really wanted to show it to emphasize that art can be totally about the form, about what you get from it aesthetically and about the concept or about the idea behind it. The artist perhaps had a specific idea, but again, sometimes it's presented in a way that's very open and we bring a lot to it. Um, and this is another piece, like many, that the more I spent time with, the more I 
had such an appreciation, have such an appreciation for the subtle shifts in the formal elements, in the line, in all the lines and the angles, um, and how this really shifts as you go around it, um, which I think we really need to pay attention to with three-dimensional work and having three-dimensional work in the home. Um, but for me, it's a total uh, celebration of line and angle and color. And I really felt like I was part of that work and aware of my relationship physically to it as I moved around it and as I noticed different things going around it. In addition to this being like a, a form itself, I found that it also created space around it, maybe in not such a defined way, but it created space from the shadows that came from it. And I think you could have a lot of possibilities like lighting this work <laughs> in, in any setting. Um, so in the shadows, um, and then in also just like these very subtle ways that small angles are created, I was really aware actually of these little interior spaces that were made. And I really appreciate that. I found it really sensitive way of creating space. One of the things that I find really compelling about this work and similar work that Sandy has done um, in this vein is how, it, how difficult it is to actually understand the scale. Like if you s see it as a photograph, you don't really know how big it is. Could be monumental. There's something strangely monumental about it. Um, and when I see it in person, it, it is very intimate, but I, I, it still conveys that sense of monumentality. Um, so even though it's um, really, uh, you know, could fit on my lap, um, where, so where I am large, when I look at it, I see my body as small in relation to it, ship to it and experiencing it as a monumental object, which I find so fascinating how the object can create this phenomenological shift in terms of how I experience it. It's kind of like a painting where you feel like you're inside of it, right? There's certain things that just change your, your, how you imagine yourself in relation to the object. And then the surface um, is this beautiful blue, and I don't know if it's the lighting or if there is a bit of gradation in the blue, the, the pigment. Um, but it's just lovely, sensitive, and my home is not the right home for this work, <laughs> but I, I can, um, I, I kind of wish it was <laughs> that I had a more like minimal aesthetic where I could set something off like that, but I am, I'm too messy. <laughs> but just, yeah, just the elegance of it and the, the line, it's just, um, so it doesn't necessarily evoke any kind of narrative, but I still feel that it's connecting with me personally, yeah. so which is interesting about more abstract art that you, are not connecting because of the subject matter, anything recognizable, you're connecting um, based on aesthetic quality, like whether it's a color or, or the form, how you still have this ability to connect mm. like in, a, in a personal way. I think that's really um, one of the fascinating things actually about art and how, um, how we connect to this, these objects and these images. How it makes you feel yeah. and how an object like this can provoke such feelings, make you remember such things. And these aren't things that I think we can define, by the way, and we don't 
have to define <laughs> everything in our lives. But it, it makes me think of um, how there is, uh, in a way, a vocabulary, a visual art. Um, we can talk about it, but there's, then it goes beyond that. It resonates with us on an emotional and perhaps spiritual level, which is something that I really feel with this work too. It's like, you know how when you listen to a piece of music and it can take you to a very specific time and place in your life. And I, I feel that way with certain works of art too. Um, and I, there's a certain time in my life where when I look at this piece, <laughs> I have a certain feeling, kind of like a memory. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about how this work is situated in the context of art in Saskatchewan. Um, you know, you were just talking, Sandra, about like these really subtle and sensitive gradations of color um, and, and a really lovely texture on these as well that again, you need to see in person. Um, that's something that actually for me is like a little bit different if we look at how a piece like this comes down the modernist line of art in this province. So if we just like reach back <laughs> for a couple minutes and look at 1950s, 1960s, we've got the Emma Lake art workshops going on just a little bit north of where I live in <laughs> Prince Albert. And um, these, these big figures in art coming from New York and sharing their modernist ideals, which was really about line and color and shape and how those could be used to convey a certain feeling, communicate a certain emotion, but there's, they were accompanied by very specific um, visual elements. So like there was no shading um, in, in a work of art. Say you're going to draw or paint an egg, like you wouldn't maybe paint in the shadows of the egg, you would, you would perhaps paint a flat oval, or if you're doing a sculptural work, you might not mold it very much to show something, but there's a, a, a sense of flatness there, um, of like straightforward color. Um, and these were ideas that were really passed down and that you actually can see in quite a few pieces <laughs> at, at Art Now. Um, and it was, it's also a history that's dominated by men working in art and in painting. And I guess this is a bit of like a little bit of an undercurrent is talking about female, male considerations, both in a contemporary and historical sense. But looking at how Sandy's work fits in there, I think there's some shared elements and, and ways of creating that come from that modernist history. But again, with this different sensitivity being made today, the beautiful subtlety of it all and, and our relationship to it. it. There's a sense that it, it can be dominating, but also it's, it's not. It's a little bit more personal. So I really appreciate that about her work. This was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. And it went by really fast. <laughs> So I know we could talk for many hours <laughs> about this, but thank you so much, everyone. We need a bottle of wine there. for that. Yeah, that's right. It's pretty dry in here. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, okay. Do you have a couple minutes? Oh, no, yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, are there any questions or comments from our live audience? No. Okay. Well, with that, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you so much, Sandra, for being uh, part of the conversation. I really appreciate your insights and your interpretation. So thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> OK. Good night, everyone. Take care. <laughs>